Welcome back everybody to this uh, next tutorial I'm going to be doing for you and today we're going to be painting a Salamander's Leviathan Dreadnought and I'm going to be doing it with lots of the new Warpaint Fanatic range from the Army Painter which they kindly sent to me. Uh, so I've been testing these things out for you guys. Uh, I always think rather than me painting them onto bases or I think they're called swatches, are they, or something like that? Uh, actually, me putting them onto a model is probably going to be more useful for you guys. Um, that way you get to see kind of how I paint things, uh, and we can also test out these paints as well. Now, I'm going to be using not just the new Fanatic wall paint range, though. I'm also going to be using uh, speed paints, and I'm going to be using the air range. So a real mishmash of uh, Army Painter products. Uh, but basically, we're going to be taking you through all the way through how to paint this uh salamanders green this salamanders leviathan uh, dreadnought so best thing to do is to work in sub assemblies i know let me tell you i know that it's so tempting to um put the model together and just glue it entirely together because you want to look at it and you think it looks really cool uh, i've been there but honestly it's better to work in sub assemblies especially when you have things like green parts and black parts for example um, but also getting access to the head as well it's always much easier if you pin these things on corks. So we're going to use Savage Green, uh, which is an air paint. Now, I am going to explain a little bit later why exactly I'm using this green opposed to, say, an equivalent from the Warpaint Fanatic range. Um, suffice to say, though, this is um, similar to the colour scheme that I've used for my previous Salamanders and my own personal Salamanders Force as well. But we're going to use Green Skin and Demonic Yellow, and we're going to use that uh, with five parts green skin to one part demonic yellow. So we use that um, uh, air paint to kind of give a really good coat over everything, about three thin coats. And then what you can see me doing with this mix, this demonic yellow and green skin mix, is basically just giving it a highlight. So thinking about the angles of the model, thinking about um, doing dynamic highlighting as well. So it might not necessarily be realistic, but it certainly will pop and be dynamic. Um, so I've kind of included all the footage here as well as much as I can do. Um, so you can use this as your own reference. So you can go back and watch this and you can see, um, you know, this demonic yellow and green skin mix. So, um, you yeah, know, we've talked a lot on previous videos about the Warpaint Fanatic range and the fact that they've got this color triad. Um, and what I suppose I'm trying to do is show you that you don't have to just work within the colors that they give you. You can mix colors up to create new colors as well. Um, and that affects the vibrancy, affects the, the hue of the color, it affects the brightness of the color um, as well. So I suppose that I just want to do as much experimentation with these colors for you guys to see what it, you know what can be done with them while also being a useful just general leviathan tutorial i guess that's what my aim of this video is today um so the mix as i said is five parts green skin to one uh, two parts demonic yellow so a five to two ratio um and then a little bit later we use another uh, another mix you could always um you know if you've got a big army of salamanders to do you could always you know create a big pot of this or a mixing pot or whatever um, but it's a fairly easy kind of recipe to remember this one and in terms of the actual color itself so i have spoken lots of times about the fact that i really like vibrant colors on the tabletop i think they really stand out you know either on armies on display um or when you're playing a game which is why i always tend to go for more vibrant armies or at least if there's a color scheme I would tend to try and make it more vibrant. So we're going to make, use a mix of ferocious green and demonic yellow here. So we're going to use this in a one-to-one -one mix and this is going to be our, our top highlight. We won't go any lighter than this. And you can see just in the airbrush cup how kind of vibrant that this color is. Because obviously it's tending towards the yellow, you know, not not towards a, a say a, a desaturated green, you know, green just with mixed in with uh, uh, mixed in with whites you know we've added yellow to add vibrancy uh, in there um, but in terms of the highlights just keep the highlights slightly tighter we want to be able to see 
all three of the kind of the different colors that we've put down you know that original base color the mid-tone and then this being the highlight as well so just keep them slightly tighter you know you can do that by uh, bringing the airbrush slightly closer to the model rather than keeping it you know f further away if you keep it further away the spray pattern will be broader if you bring it closer um, it will it will be tighter so coming up next we are going to be using some savage green now this color i said i would explain why i've used this so um the war paint fanatic range is fantastic in terms of its coverage but what i needed was a color that was almost slightly thinner a color that's slightly translucent and this uh savage green is exactly the color now you saw right at the start if we build it up in thin coats over a black primer yeah, you, you do have the color that you want, but actually, if you were to have a look at it um, on a palette, for example, it's slightly translucent, which is perfect. And the reason why I used it instead of a War Paint Fanatic, because what I'm doing here is I'm spraying the Savage Green into the shadows of this model. And I have thinned it down with um, some airbrush thinner. But what it allows me to do is bring back some contrast into the model it allows everything just to tie together really nicely all those kind of all those sick fades that i've created um it just ties everything together really well but really what i'm doing is i'm i'm upping the contrast on on the panels of this model and that's why i've used the savage green because it's slightly translucent uh so i have used that one-to-one -one mix of uh, demonic yellow and ferocious green and rather than edge highlighting, forget that, like, no way am I edge highlighting a Leviathan model, that will take me forever. Uh, what you can see I'm doing is just using some very precise uh, um, dry brushing with a makeup sponge, and I'm just picking out the edges. Um, so, you know, just it, I speeded up the video, so it looks quite, I'm being quite heavy handed with it, but I'm just really focusing on the corners here um, and all of the edges just to help render the shape. And then the shoulder pad. So I foolishly, stuck on the shoulder pads um i would recommend that you don't stick on the shoulder pads and just do these uh separate um, but it doesn't make yeah it's not that too much of a big deal and then you can see matte black so again this is their new matte black um i'm just yeah giving it a coat over the uh over the shoulder pads but you know as i say it would probably be better that if you did this separately i think um, but the coverage is generally really, really good uh, on the matte black. I think I just did it once and then it was done. Uh, so I'm using a one-to-one -one mix of matte black and then afterglow as well to create a bit of a grey. Um, and it's an unusual grey because obviously it's got kind of this yellowish green in, um, but it creates a really, really nice grey for the salamanders that you can highlight your black with. So often I don't render black with uh, a highlight, but I wanted to show you, um, again, some of the mixing, some of the things that we can do, some wacky and wild things that we can do with this these uh, war paints um, and I just thought it just using the afterglow and the black mixed together I thought just created a really interesting um, gray color so on to transfers now so the model has been given a gloss uh, varnish if you want to know more about how I do transfers and my kind of rationale about why I would use a gloss varnish at this point I have done a whole video about uh, kind of applying transfers and then weathering them Needless to say, though, I've gloss varnished the model in order for the transfers to sit flat over it. So what we don't want to do is be able to see a ring around the transfer. And um, we don't want any air bubbles underneath the transfer as well. And doing this over a gloss varnish rather than just the model painted as normal will help. Yeah, will help with that process. Obviously, a gloss varnish is a smooth surface for these transfers to sit over. It's up to you which uh, transfers that you want to use. I was intending to put like loads of flames everywhere on the model, but actually, it turned out that I didn't. I didn't have that many flames left over on my transfer sheet because I've used it previously. Um, next up, so we applied the micro uh, set first, and then uh, we put the transfer over. And then what you can see me doing here is using micro sole dipping a cotton wool bud into microsol and then just rolling over the transfer just getting rid of any air bubbles that might have appeared but also just making sure that it kind of stays down and adheres to the surface i would do this one or two times uh, in order to make sure that the transfer is um, kind of nice and flat and smooth you can see just doing a little bit of sponging with oak brown again it's completely up to you what uh, color you want to do your chipping with um, you could use silver 
but I suppose um, what I'm kind of show here is either you know the armored ceramite underneath, but also the armored ceramite is starting to decolor, I suppose, because a little bit later I'll use a little bit of dry brushing on the very edges where there's maybe fresh um, ceramite. So I'll dry brush some metallics onto it a little bit later where you know you can just see the fresh ceramite underneath it. But you know, I'm no law expert, it's completely up to you what color ceramite you want underneath it. I just think that brown as a chipping color just often looks better than silver. I wouldn't use silver very often, only kind of in particular places on a model and certainly not all the way around a model. The exception might be were bearers. I think I probably would, because it's such a dark red, I would probably use um, some kind of uh, silver chipping on it. So we're gonna use some oil paints now. So once we've done all our chipping with our oak brown, we're gonna mix up some oil paints. Now this is just mixed with some uh, spirits, some white spirits, some thinner, and you mix the oil paints in, and then we want a consistency like this. You can see, I've put all this footage in so you can kind of see the consistency. I've just used a cheap Tupperware container. Uh, you can get them off like 50 off Amazon for like 15 quid or something. I use them for packing, but also for mixing oils as well. And then what we can do is use this as a pin wash. So again, it's helping to render the shapes of the model without too much hard work. It's not like I'm doing this with a wash. So the thing about washes is that, you know, you can see I'm being quite slapdash with this because I know that I can wipe it away in a little bit. But if I was to do this with washes, um, I'd have to be really precise and then it would take more time. Um, and, you know, sometimes actually th there's no need to do that. You know, the oils are doing exactly what we we need them to do in this scenario, which is to help render all the uh, the shapes on the model to help also pick out um, the rivets and um, all the lines and do the panel lining as well. So I find that oils are, are best for the armor, but you will see me use washes for the metallics a little bit later. So I do use them in conjunction with one another. I just think that in certain situations, oils perform a really useful job um, uh, just to speed up the process of doing things like panel lining. And what you can see me doing here with a cotton wool bud is I am dipping it in some clean white spirit and just wiping away where I've been a bit heavy handed with those oils. Um, and then you can see me doing it in a downwards motion. And what that starts to create is some streaking that we'll kind of lean into a little bit later. But if you just want some subtle streaking on your model, this is a great way to do it. Just drag gently uh, the oils down where you've used a little bit too much and this just naturally starts to create some really nice subtle streaking as well. And you can see actually all my motions really are, well, most of them are all in a downwards motion uh, just to kind of simulate grime and dust being kind of, you know, falling down the armor from rain, for example. Oils, check them out. You need to have a look at them because I think that um, they will make your, they're, they're not too scary. I've done lots of videos about kind of gloss varnishes that you can use. And also don't forget a gloss varnish also helps with the capillary action um, as well. You know, I've used here a gloss varnish through the airbrush, uh, but you can get Rattlecan gloss varnishes as well, you know, but I would look into oils because a tube of oils is relatively inexpensive and will last you, you know, a year, two years, if not longer. Um, depending on how, how you know how much you use them because they they have a really long shelf life right what you can see me doing i've just mixed a little bit of neat oils here um onto the model or place them onto the model rather and with a fan brush what i'm doing is i'm just dragging those oils down in order to create uh, some more streaking patterns just the to create wear and tear just to create the idea that it's been in in a fight for a very very long time and it just helps with that you know almost yeah you know, the whole thing about i suppose grim dark i suppose if you spoke to any grim dark artists they say it's about simulating the environment and showing that that model has been in a certain environment and i suppose that's exactly what we're doing here i wouldn't describe this as grim dark um i wouldn't even describe my painting style as a grim dark painting style really um but um you can certainly take things from different schools of thought when it comes to painting and then apply them to your own models and certainly you know showing that this um model has or showing that this dreadnought has been in the wars you know from doing all this kind of wear and tear so you can see here this has been given a matte varnish army painters matte varnish through the airbrush again though they do a rattle can matte varnish that you might want to look into um if you want to use oils and gloss varnish things uh so we're going to use gunmetal so this is their some of their new war paint fanatic um 
a gunmetal uh, paint. So this is a really, really nice paint. If you want it to be darker, we will use washes a little bit later, but you could always mix in a little bit of matte black into it as a, as a, as a base, but there are other metallics that they do. I just thought this was a good dark ish color, um, where I could edge highlight it or dry brush it a little bit later. Um, and the, the dry brushing would, would stand out. But as I say, we will knock this back a little bit later. Uh, one coat, one coat. That was all it took. I didn't need to go back over uh, with that gunmetal color. Just one coat all the way around the model and it covered really, really nicely. Let's talk about the coppers and the bronzes. So rough iron, really, really nice color um, and a great uh, base for any kind of metallics you want to do. We've also got True Copper. This is the color of True Copper. So there's quite a jump between Rough Iron and True Copper. That's Weapon Bronze. I don't think I actually ended up using Weapon Bronze. We've got Evil Chrome, and we've also got Mithril as well. Now, I'm gonna use a mixture of Rough Iron and True Copper at about a 50-50 mix as a base. So I'm gonna use True Copper a little bit later. I've put as much footage as I can do here. So you can, metallics often can be a little bit scary, I think, for people, um, but I've, I'm, try to put as much as I can do, you know, while keeping it a sensible length of video. Um, but the jump between that first color, uh, which I completely forgotten what it's called now, whichever color that we had just a moment ago, um, between true copper is such a big jump. So using a 50, 50 mix will get you to a kind of like a nice place. And I think as a base coat for bronzes, those two mixed together are really, really nice. And what you can see me doing here is just laying down those colors. Um, and um, this only, again, took one coat. I didn't, it didn't require two coats. So these metallics go over, over um, particularly matte surfaces really, really nicely. Would they go over gloss surfaces as nicely? Probably not, but that's the same for any metallics really, or any color, which is that sometimes it's hard for metallics to get a bite on a model when they're going over gloss, gloss surfaces. So going over matte, these went really nicely. And you can see this is the mixture of rough iron and uh, true copper. I remembered what it was called now. Um, so next up, what we're gonna do, we're gonna use true copper um and uh again this is a really really nice color but what i would say is that with all of my metallic work with the exceptions of kind of display miniatures certainly when you're thinking about kind of your tanks and things like that and your basic infantry we can be quite we can afford to be quite rough with the highlights on our models you know it wouldn't make sense that our armor is completely battered and then the metallics are really pristine you know, so we can actually afford to be a, a little bit, um, I don't want to say slapdash, but we can afford to be a little bit rough and ready with our metallics. And you can see me here just, you know, slopping on these metallics, thinking about where the highlights are going to be, thinking, you know, the, you can see the, um, I guess, the rebreather on the front. I'm not really sure what that kind of big chunk of circular metal would be but you can see me thinking about actually at the top it would be brighter than the bottom and then you can see me here on the top of the kind of the torso guards highlighting where the light would hit so not the entire surface isn't getting a, a highlight with this true copper um, so think about those highlights think about where the light will naturally hit and you can shine it under a lamp to kind of work out exactly where those highlights would hit, but we can be quite rough with them. So we're gonna use a mixture of True Copper and Evil Chrome now as our kind of final step up. And then we're just gonna keep, we again, you can afford to be quite rough and ready with these highlights, but you're gonna keep them a little bit tighter. So you can see now actually, you know, how rough I'm being, I'm not being too precise with them. Uh, but I am trying to keep in a smaller band each and every time as we apply these metallics. And I think that's a good rule of thumb to have just with uh, vehicles um, and your basic infantry, which is that you can afford to be a little bit slapdash with metallics and a little bit rough. Um, but it's in the next steps where things are going to come together and we'll have kind of some kind of edge highlights or dry brushing to, to pick out some of the edges uh, that will kind of give the impression that we spent a really, really long time on them, but in reality, we haven't. The thing about the metallics on any model, as you guys will know, it's, it's, it's hard work because putting the base color down is always the, 
the bit that takes a while. So we're going to use purple tone and light tone. So, um, you know, why am I using this mix? I don't know. I just like brown and purples mixed together as washes for uh, coppers and golds. Golds, it's obvious why, because um, purples contrast with yellows in the gold really nicely. But I've just found that this is a really nice wash for uh, coppers as well. So, you know, whenever you see my work, more often than not, my metallic work, when it's kind of coppers and golds, it's going to have a mixture of brown and uh, purples in it mixed together. I think that if Army Painter wanted to create a new wash, like these two mixed together would be really, really nice as a kind of just a, a, a general wash. And I've also mixed in a little bit of satin. So you can just see um, it's a 50-50 mix of this wash. And I've just mixed in two dollops of Army Painter satin. Um, and I've done that. You know, you could use gloss if you want to. Um, but I've just added a little bit of satin in because I don't want to completely dull the metallics down now these washes don't completely mat down the metallics but i still want them to have some luster and if you think about the textures on the model one of the striking things when you saw it right at the beginning is the fact that we've got this absolutely matte plate and then we've still got some luster and shine to our metallics and i really really like that look i like having contrast in textures on a model um, some of you might be like no no i just want the entire model to be completely matte and that's absolutely fine. It's just about personal taste and personal preference. There's no wrong or right. Uh, it's just what what you will you know what you end up liking and how you want your models to look. So using this purple, brown, uh, satin finished wash all over the model, um, I just think like with any washes that you use, you know the general rule of thumb will always be just be careful about pooling. And once you've left the model, you know think about going back to it. Um, yeah, maybe a couple of minutes later and just catching any pooling that you might have found because that's always a, a big, big worry. You know, you don't want to spend all this time on your model and then have big unsightly pooling in certain areas. The satin, the other thing I would say about satin is that it will help the um, flow of the washes. Not that they don't flow really nicely already. It's just that, you know, it will help it to flow. Uh, so using our purple and um, our kind of like our brown color, our light wash here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in some dark tone into this. Um, and this is going to create an almost kind of like oily wash for our silvers. So the ratio would be one to one to two. So we had one purple, one light tone, and then um, two lots of the brown. And again, I'm using a little bit of satin in this as well. I find uh, you can, if you want to, just use black on silvers. That, that's that's completely legitimate. That's absolutely fine. You know, no worries there. But just think about making it a little bit more interesting. You know, think about these metallics being oily. You know, think about these metallics having different colors within them, different sheens, sheens within them. But I think, as you can see, as it goes down now, it's dark enough um, that it will, the, the shapes and all the panel lining that you would want from a wash, that's exactly what it's doing here. So there's no worries about using different colors, but I just think it's a more interesting, uh, you know, using different color washes is more interesting on your silvers than just say using a black color. What we will do though, a little bit later is, um, use some actual oil technical effects as well. This was a uh, strong tone I've mixed in here. I said dark tone, but actually it's strong tone. And I'll write all the colors in the uh, comments for you guys as well. So you, you know which I'm, uh, which ones I'm gonna be using. So we're gonna be using uh, mithril here um, and we're gonna be using this as a dry brush. Now you can see what kind of dry brushes I use. I use makeup brushes and this one basically fell apart and has been stuck together with a uh, piece of masking tape. So you can see kind of how I treat these models. But I, I find, you know, there are loads of companies, including the Army Painter, that do uh, dry brushes. Um, the reason why though I've chosen to use a makeup brush and particularly for this model, I've used a flat one is because I, I need to be a bit more precise because I don't want too many or that much um, silver on uh, the matte green. And so using a flat brush just helps me gain a little bit more control than say a round brush, which is why I like the makeup brushes because they come in all kinds of uh, different shapes and sizes. And then I'm just using the silver, the mithril silver here on the edges just to pick out the acids. And this is this is great because what it does is just adds more luster 
to the um, to the metallics. And we can, again, be quite rough and ready. This is not an edge highlight, it's a dry brush. So again, you're starting to consider and think about actually, you know, this chipping and the scratches on these metallics because the it's, it wouldn't be right that our armor is completely battered and the metallics are pristine, as I said before. So, you know, consider that, think about that. Um, but, you know, you might want to, as an alternative, uh, you, know, you might want to think, okay, I could use evil chrome mixed in with a little bit of mithril silver to have a maybe more natural highlight for the bronzes and the coppers. But actually, this this works uh, just as well. So eye lenses. So we're going to use some fluorescent uh, paints. And what you can see I've done for the eye lenses is I have painted it black. And then um, I painted kind of the eye lens uh, white and I'm going to use data system glow and lens flare glow as well. I'll probably just refer to them as fluorescent green and fluorescent yellow because um, that's essentially what they are, but just for explanation. But when you do the uh, white in the eye, when you paint it, I'd recommend leaving a black kind of ring around it. Um, as well. We'll go into some close-ups in a minute so you can see what I mean. Now you don't need to thin any of these colors and I actually don't think you need a wet palette either on any of these colors because they are super thin already. I've talked in previous videos about these will just go straight through the airbrush but because they're quite thin you need multiple coats. I would say probably three or four coats to get a really bright popping fluorescent green. What's great about eye lenses like this, if you're not somebody who's very precise, uh, this is great because we, we can afford to go on to the, uh, around the eye lens, around the bottom, um, and to kind of simulate that glow, which is what I really love about eye lenses like this, which is that anybody can achieve them and they look good no matter what. And you can see me, this is just my fourth go, um, kind of building up this layer over the eye lens but also underneath the eye as well with the green um, but honestly fluorescent glowing eyes for people who don't want to spend time kind of you know or feel like they're not very precise this is the way forward they look really striking uh, and they don't take that much skill or effort to be honest so what I've done here in fact you can see me doing here is I'm painting a white kind of just I guess like a rectangle just closer to the edge of the eye so we've still got some of the green exposed but towards the center of the eye or kind of the end of the eye towards the nose I've just painted that bit white and what I'm doing now is using the fluorescent yellow color just going over that um, that white area that I just painted and you can you know have it over the the green areas as well but really we're just focusing on that white part and what reapplying that white does is create an intensity to the yellow that we wouldn't have and then that's the eye lens done you could give that two or three uh, thin coats of the fluorescent yellow and then that's enough so we're going to use some uh dark rust here and i showed you fresh rust um, as well but actually I've just used dark rust and that, I, that was all I needed I was like oh maybe I need some fresh rust nope honestly dark rust looks fantastic so I've just mixed this with a little bit of airbrush thinner you can mix it with a little bit of uh, water instead if you don't have airbrush thinner but remember I, t I talk about this quite a lot the airbrush thinner has a little bit of foam prover in it which helps the flow of the paint so that's the reason why I'm using it rather than just using water but water will do you know you, this is absolutely fine and what I'm doing is I'm just using this as a rusty wash over my metallics and then it will go into all the nooks and the crannies and just adds a little bit of uh, flavor just adds a little bit of um, kind of depth to the metallics and again just makes them a little bit more interesting and, and shows that they're aged I guess to match um, the rest of the um, the rest of the armor however I did want to try this and you might be like oh uh, it's rusty and you're using oils yeah I am because I want to show you guys what all these paints can do and I've not seen anybody use the oil stains yet in a kind of a, in a model context so let's imagine that it got rusty and then a tech came along and went oh it's very rusty around here we'll need to put some oil stains on your uh, joint so I'm kind of thinking this is I'm using this more like um, kind of engine oil or engine grind wd-40 style kind of thing where any joints can have this um oil stains in to simulate 
um, kind of where there are moving gears and moving parts and the lubricant that you would need for moving gears and moving parts. Um, and I just think that's a, it just adds, I think, a little bit of depth to the model, um, makes it more interesting, kind of, you know, thinking, harping back to things like scale models and things like that, you know, where they would use kind of oil stains um, and kind of grime and lubricants and things like that on their on their vehicles. Um, and then we are going to be doing a heat bloom. I'm going to use an unusual one. So I'm going to use reds and purples here. Um, not very typical, but I think that it looks good against the green. Again, think about green and reds being um, contrasting colors and making the heat bloom just stand out. You can use whatever heat bloom that you want to. And this is definitely not realistic, but I think it looks cool. So this is slaughter red thinned with a little bit of airbrush thinner. Um, and I'm just hitting the, the end of this, probably trying to go down about two thirds of the way down um, any kind of piping. I mean, you can see the airbrush more than you can see the actual gun there. And then we're going to use Hive Dweller Purple. Again, we're going to thin this a little bit with a little bit of airbrush thinner. And then we're just going to move further up and along the barrel. So we still want to see some of that red underneath, but we just hit, want to hit the tippity top of the um, uh, of the gun barrels. And then this red and this purple, that's it, it's done. No more than that. And it creates a really, really interesting um, kind of heat bloom effect, which I really, really like against green. I have used this though on my own Alpha Legion and I've used this on my Imperial Fist as well. I think it looks really, really nice um, on all of those, but it's not the only way to do it. And as I say, it's completely unrealistic. And here it is. This is the final model. Um, as for the base, uh, I used just some weathering powders, some tufts, some rocks, nothing too kind of amazing or fancy. Um, but really, I want to show you guys kind of the actual model itself um, and show you kind of all the parts. What I have done is gone around the model in terms of the guns and the back parts and filled in any gaps that are supposed to be black. I think it's worth just going the extra effort uh, on those bits. But as you can see, I'm really pleased with it. I think it looks really good. Um, and I hope it was an educational video showing you some things that perhaps you haven't seen previously with the Warpaint Fanatic ranges. And please don't forget to comment, don't forget to like, and of course, please don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed the video and got all the way to the end as well. Take care, guys, and I shall see you on the next one.